Digital marketing seems to be the mystery that most entrepreneurs struggle with, and real estate investors are no exception. The truth is, there are multiple avenues to success. Those experiences will be best shared by the guests on this podcast. My name is Jason Wright, and I would like to welcome you to Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories. What is going on? Jason Wright here, and you were listening to episode number 20 of the show. And you already know what I'm going to say, don't you? I'm going to say, if you've ever heard another episode, you already know it's coming. I've got another great guest this week, which I do firmly believe. But before we get into the conversation, some of my thoughts. And you know what? Like episode 19, these thoughts actually parallel and segue into the guest. I'm actually starting to do things that make sense. I'm uh, clapping at my own growth here. All right, so here are some of my thoughts today. Uh, kind of the, the topic is success breeds more success. But none of that matters if you don't consider the beginning. So as an entrepreneur, as a capital raiser, as an investor, all of us start in the same place, ground zero. Anybody who's had a lot of success starts at the same place that somebody who has not much success starts at, the beginning. So you got to remember... Things can take some time to get moving at the beginning. Things can be gritty, dirty, and you can work hard. Little return, that's just how it goes, right? Welcome to planet Earth. But once you get started and a few things start to work, even if they're tiny little victories, you get this beautiful thing working for you called momentum. Have you ever had to push a car in neutral for a variety of reasons? Maybe it's round of gas. Maybe it won't start, etc. For some reason, I have found myself in that scenario many, many times in my life. And when I think about pushing a car in neutral, if it's on flat ground or even slightly uphill, "Ah, who am I kidding? Let's just stick with flat ground, right? Getting it moving initially is not fun. It sucks. I can actually remember my feet slipping and hitting my chin and my forehead on a bumper before, you know, pushing so hard. But once it starts moving, I think you'll agree with me. It's easier to keep going than it is to get started. So momentum is a real thing. Momentum in business is a real thing. It can be tough to get started, but once you get it started, keeping it going requires less effort. So something else I want you to think about, and when you find something that works, my friends, please keep doing it. I see this so many times where people will try something in their marketing or try something in their business, and they find success, and they're like, no, I'm not going to do that because I want to go try this other thing. It's so dumb, right? Just keep doing what works. And while you're doing that, if you want to test something else in parallel, so be it, but keep doing what works. All right, my guest today is the one and only Derek Peterson. Good friend, good buddy. Uh, We have a ton of shared clients together. He's the founder and CEO of a whole bunch of companies. Uh, I'm going to talk about two, Adapt Media, and AdF Wealth. AdF Media is a digital marketing business. He builds brands, helps marketing systems, podcasts, websites, that kind of thing. Uh, he's done it for 800 plus companies, I believe, in the health and wellness space and the real estate investing space. Both, I know these days, his focus is like mine, active capital raisers, real estate investors. Got a bunch of experience there. Uh, and like me, he started in marketing and then came over to uh, becoming a real estate investor secondly. He's got the company Adapt Wealth where he does just that. He works with his own passive investors to help them, you know, get into deals and keep things moving. What an interesting guy. This guy's a six-time Ironman triathlete as well. I'll just tell you, the thought of running for any reason except something's trying to maul me like a bear, I'm not doing it. Like, I have zero interest in running. You used to be able to get me to chase the basketball. That's about it. I'm not running for anything. Swimming? Nah. Not, not for any kind of distance, not for me. So you think back to what I said just a little bit ago, success breeds success. Getting started, momentum, keep doing what works. Don't you think our guest today has got to do that to become a one-time Ironman triathlete, let alone six-time? Anyway, uh, you're going to start to see a theme, my friends, show to show. There's a whole consistency and effort thing that can take you a long way. So uh, I think you'll like this episode. It's a bit different. Uh, Because the guest is a bit different, but it's my show, damn it. I'll do what I want, and you'll like it. (laughs) All right, let's check out the conversation with Derek. Hey, Derek, welcome to the show. Jason, thanks for having me, brother. Appreciate it. No problem at all. So this will be an interesting show for everybody watching and listening, a little different than anything we've done so far. Derek is a unique dude 
who is an active capital raiser and a marketer. So um, this will be interesting. So you can run with this any way you want to, man. Uh, tell me, I'm a little curious how you got started with real estate investing and tell us how you got started with marketing as well. Yeah, so those, those stories are kind of one sort of flows into the other. So back in uh, 2018, uh, I owned a medical distribution company. So in a prior life, I was in OR medical device sales for many years, management, kind of did that gig for a while. Uh, and then I'd broken out into owning my own, own um, medical distribution companies, scaled some teams. We had actually 2,500 independent reps across the country and had a real good thriving business. And it was awesome. I had some partners. Um, and in 2018, and, and over the course of about five years, so like from 13 to 18, we were paid predominantly through insurance. So you'd build these big programs and insurance would just cut it and then it would die. Like literally you had this thriving company and one decision, the business was dead. So I was forced to recreate and remarket new entities under that under that umbrella. And I found over the years that the thing that I enjoyed the most was that aspect, right? Was the aspect of you know building teams, creating things, marketing them, selling it to reps, selling it to the doctors, that whole you know process of you know, what we'll call marketing. Yeah. And um, got remarried uh in 2019 but when i was uh you know courting my now wife i was like you know what i was like i just don't like this medical thing anymore i'm just i'm sick of it uh, i said i want to do what i want to do i want to do what i love and i like marketing right and we also like traveling so i said she was a dental hygienist she's like quitting that starting a travel agency and i was like tell my partners i'm done i'm gonna open a marketing firm. that's literally the conversation we had <laughs> and uh i love it and then began <laughs> I, I had one client, I, I, my first client was only my client because he was, I was his first boss out of college. So his name is Chris Benson. He's now the CIO over at Reliant uh, Real Estate Investments. So they're one of the largest self-storage operators um, in the Southeast. And so I dove into his company at more of a consultative role and I, and I was sort of a quasi marketer for them for a while on retainer. And so I pick up a couple little other clients and. And now I was in the game. So I had exposure to real estate. I had exposure to marketing. I had one employee. It was me. And uh, and that was it. And we were off to the races. Um, and, and you know, over time, over the years, I, I as a marketer, I, I took any client, right? Just like any business. You'll take yeah. anything to pay the bills at first. And then I met Tim and Greg Lyons over at Cityside Capital. Yeah. And, I, you know, they were like my, I, you know, those guys, right? I was I was with them for like, they're probably my 10th client in the capital raising space. And I was like, man, I was like, guys, I want to get into this real estate space. I'm around you guys so much. I'm like, I, I want to get into this. And they're like, man, he's like, you got a real good skill set in marketing for, you know, we're like your 10th client. You should just shift and pivot your business towards focusing just on this. And one day somebody's going to ask you to just be a partner in the real estate capital raising company because they need your skill set. I was like, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll do that. So again, snap of the fingers, made a decision, shifted everything. And then here we stand today. Sure enough, uh, I had a client who then I became his partner. We started Adapt My Wealth, which is a capital raising company. We've raised over $25 million over the last couple of years. And then uh, our marketing firm has shifted uh, to focusing just solely on building brands and health, another passion, another conversation, and wealth. And uh, and we've done branding uh for you know over 100 companies in in the um close to 125 now in the capital raising in real estate uh syndication space so i'm just we i'm all in man my as you know because we talk we talk daily i think i talk to you sometimes more than i talk to my wife you know? <laughs> is she getting jealous yet <laughs> she is she's gonna start asking questions she's like is this guy really jason or is it you know, janine or something yeah so my phone keeps blowing up with your voice text, but your voice is a little deeper, so she she hears him. So, yeah, sorry for the the middle of the night texts, but <laughs> That's if, okay. if I do not disturb on like I do, so you'll get to. <laughs> yeah, so um, for people watching and listening, Derek's skill set uh, is very complimentary to mine. Uh, actually, when I first heard of Derek, Adam Carswell said, "Hey, I got this guy. I want you to meet." He's in marketing too. I was like, I don't want to meet him. Like. I'm not friends with competitors. Like, there's no point for the relationship. So, uh, I have found this about myself. I'm a nice guy, but I'm I'm very territorial with stuff. I've worked hard to build it, and uh, 
had a, an interesting situation recently where I had to basically tell a guy, if you steal my stuff again and call it your own, we're going to have problems the next time we see each other. And we're going to mm-hmm. see each other again. And it was, you know, and uh, since the, the conversations changed a bit there, but uh, yeah, Derek and I talk daily. We get along great. He's got a great business, uh, so do I. And we got a, a lot of mutual clients, which is really a beautiful thing. So very cool. Very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> this will be interesting. So for anybody that follows the show, they know I have kind of a typical path I follow, but I'm going to be ad-libbing and jumping around today. So this will be fun. Uh, let me ask you, from the capital raising side, is there an asset class or market that you focus on? And then the other part to that question, which is a little unrelated, um, from what you do with marketing, tell us what you do with marketing. And is there any specific asset class you focus on of that marketing, or is it all capital raisers? Or something about that. Yeah, so I'll talk about on the capital raising side with, you know, Adapt My Wealth. You know, we we look to create something that was a little bit different, right? So I sit and, you know, you and I both sit in a unique position in that we had an opportunity to work with sponsors, operators, capital raisers, syndicators, everybody. And we get to see the different models, how they work, they function, fund, no fund, um, co-GP, marketing fee, all these things. And what my partner and I felt on the capital raising company is that we wanted to create a solution to the problem that we felt we had, right? And and that that problem was that like we we want information about all asset classes free of bias. So we just we didn't want any BS. Cause you know, when you go to your you go to your, you know, your crypto guy, only crypto. Crypto is the only thing. You go to your brokers like stock, stocks and bonds, right? You go to your real estate guys like, oh, it's the only thing you should be investing in. And within that bubble, it's like you got you know your self storage guy and you got your you know, your, your BTR, your vacation rentals girl, like you've got all these different things and you're getting biased information, which is fine, yeah. but you know, we can, can tend to get a little jaded. So we want to create an environment where people can come and they could learn about every single asset class, free of bias, we'll bring in experts to have conversations. And then if they do have an opportunity to present to the group where we as a collective group, as a community, get better terms than bring it, right? Um, and and that's been the I mean we call it uh, the family, so it's kind of a little Italian, a little mafioso, right? So we got the the family. Once you come join the family, and uh, and you get uh, you get access to that uh, to all that information. So that's sort of our you know unique selling proposition on on the capital raising side. And then in terms of marketing that, right? We're just sort of marketing it. Hey, if you go to the website, you read any of our copy, it's really all about community and learn, and it's all about learning. Um, you know, cause I, I, as you know, being in, in, you know, what you create with a lot of your drip campaigns and funnels, it's all about just delivering value, right. And consistently delivering value. So we wanted to just consistently be a resource. And our feeling is if you're able to teach somebody something, that's how you build that trust, you know, and then, and then naturally they'll gravitate towards our, op- our opportunities and, and it works. It's been working. Um, it's not too dissimilar from other platforms that are out there, but we really focused on the community side so far as we're actually considering developing an app for it. So it is a true social media kind of feel and vibe to it, which be a little bit different. That's a heavy lift. Um, it's an expensive lift. So we're still kind of toying with that. You being the endurance athlete that you are, you love heavy lifts. (laughs) <laughs> I, I love long, excruciating, tireless, uh, yeah, types of uh, types of events. It's a weird, masochistic. Like I enjoy pain. Like that, I don't have a red room or anything like that. So, but it, it's <laughs> did I go down the wrong lane with this podcast already? It didn't take long. I'm five minutes in. I already mentioned the red room. Um, so, so we. Uh, but no, I, I enjoy the. Uh, the challenge of something difficult. So um, almost to a fault, I think sometimes. Yeah. So what I hear you saying about the marketing piece is uh, when a passive investor considers joining you guys, you make him an awful, I can't refuse. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let me ask you, uh, when you were getting um, your businesses up and running and you can take this any way you want to, what like basic fundamental marketing strategies allowed you to start getting traction? You know, what, got you investors, what got you clients. And uh, one thing I'll commend you on is you're just a very authentic dude. And as we know, and you're great on camera, um, that can go a long way, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So for me, I think, 
when you're building a brand, it sort of boils down to three basic fundamentals. I think we've talked about this and we ironically, I think, share the same three things. We may call them something different, but you know, for the for me, it's it doesn't matter what you're selling, right? We're all selling the same thing. We're all the same thing. Like we're all a solution to a problem, right? You're a solution problem, I'm a solution to a problem. So the question is, okay, how do you identify how do you let the customer know that you're a solution to their problem, right? So really how do you I hate using the word identify, but how do you uh, connect with them, um, you know, to let them know that they're the hero in their story, you understand the issue they have, and you're here to be a guide yep. in their story yep. versus flipping it, which is like, hey, we're awesome. We're great. You should work with us because we have an awesome track record. We do awesome things. That's making you, the company, the hero in the story. Yeah. So it's really flipping it upside uh, down on its head. It's a story branding technique. Yeah, I was going to say, yep. Yep. I started calling so, you Miller. Great book by Dom Miller. For anyone who's, who's listened to this, write it down. Story brand, Dom Miller. That's a real good one. So the first thing is, um, and there's a no particular order. Really, the first two are, you know, first and second, and second and first. They're really both in the first position. And that's one, you have to have a good front end in terms of you have to have a good place where people land, where every podcast you're on, every business card you hand out, you know, every meetup you go to, you're sending all roads lead to Rome. They're all going to the same place. That's your website. Today's day and age, the website is still the thing. It's still important. You know, we got all this AI and all this cool stuff that's coming out, but I don't think that experience is going to change. You need a home base. You need a digital storefront. And that needs to have certain elements into it, which I can get into. But one thing it needs to have a lot of is this, Jason, right? Video, right? Yep. So you got to see, you got to get your personality out. You got to, uh, uh, you have the right copy, the right design. You have to have the right lead magnets to be able to, you know, kind of get your hook into those individuals and then pull them into the other equally important thing, which is the back end. What you do, right? This is why we work so well together yeah. is because together they create the perfect mousetrap. And it's hard for one to like, I can build just a bomb ass website, right? But if there's not a back end to it that's doing anything, it's completely useless. And I would argue the same way around, right? If you if we don't have good attractive lead magnets or the website isn't built right, it's not really serving people into your community, into your environment on the back end. So those two things bolted together, front end, back end, um, together create the perfect mousetrap. So we'll call those one and two. And then the third thing is, okay, how do I get people there? It's very simple, right? So, and there's a ton of different ways in which you can do that. It depends on your product, um, but specifically in the capital ring space, you know, we, we really push and promote creating a thought leadership platform or a voice. Yeah. So those those things together for any any of any capital raiser that's listening out there, those are really the three principles that I think, you know, whether you work with with Jason or myself or or anybody out there, you got to nail those things because with without if you have one of those pieces missing, it's like a it becomes a two legged stool and it's going to fall over. Yep. Well, well said. And I I, uh, I don't know if I've shared this story with you, but um, when I was starting this business, this is probably five years ago. I would work full time. I commute two hours a day, and I would spend all my time on this business, as my wife called it. And she came in here one day, very frustrated, and said, "When is this business going to make money? Like, what are we doing? What are we working towards?" And I couldn't answer the question because I had become very good at getting attention online, but I had no idea what to do with it. I didn't send them anywhere. I didn't have an offer. I was on Upwork, right, making some sales every month, but it was completely separate and irrelevant with the stuff I was doing on social media. And I was like, I have no idea what to do with it. So for me, when I started with that back end, front end, then traffic, um, it, it made a big difference. And like with the offer I have now, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy good. So, but it takes time sometimes, but, um, yeah, I thought it had to be more complicated than it actually is. So I used to try to, I need to invent something no one's ever heard of. And, um, that can be good, but it's not necessary as well simplicity is is everything in marketing i learned that i forget what book it was um but it it clicked for me and it was like a quote from einstein like it's like anyone can make and i may totally butcher this quote but anyone can make anything complicated yeah. but true genius comes in stripping it down and making it simple yeah. and it's also when you have simplicity like in your messaging and your marketing and your yeah. funnels in the front end back end all that stuff it, it takes away the stress for buyers when they arrive. They're like, oh, uh, yeah, that, that's my problem. Like you get, you get me, right? 
like, oh, I have to have that lead magnet. Like, damn, like that's good. Like, let me give you my email and phone number. Yep. You know, and those are the, it, and, and that comes through simplicity. If you got too much stuff going on, you're right. I was the same way. I'd overcomplicate brands and stuff more things in there just to intimate value, yep. just so it looked more full. I um, mean, like a sculptor doesn't like make an ear and slap it on the side. They strip away stuff to make it look more beautiful, right? And that's yeah. that's kind of the the, the 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 concept of you know what you and I try to collaborate on. Uh, when you were saying that, it reminded me of uh, an example I see regularly with text marketing. Right? People will say, "Man, you always say you have such good experience with text. Like, what's your secret?" I'm like, simplicity, right? I text the same way I speak, so like you feel like we're we're inner circle friends. And it's one or two sentences. I'm either saying, hey, Derek, did you see the email I just sent you? I'm directing you somewhere else. Or I'm asking you an open-ended question. The mistake people make is they want to drop a damn blog post into a text. I'm like, <laughs> and they like they sign their name. And I'm like, they already know it's from you because you said, hey, Derek, Jason, or you don't need to sign your name. Nobody does that in text. Like that's just nobody automated and cold and impersonal. Like stop making it hard. Mm -hmm. Sentences, yeah. facts. Right, like you speak to your friends or family. And if you do that, you will find that you get wildly better results. But Jason, you don't understand. My avatar are doctors. They're still people. They're just they, they're they still dude and bro and hey man you. They're not like, you know, outside when they take the white coat off, right? They're they're human <laughs> beings, you know, and it's you're so right, man. You're so good at that because I get your emails and your texts. I, you know, I'm, I, I've I get them because I entered into your funnel a while back and um and you're right. It's I feel like I'm talking to you, right? You have a uh, everyone has a personality. You, your personality resonates from there, yep. you know, and very genuine, which is and, and that's what connects with people yep. because they they feel like they're just talking to a guy and they're not talking to some business. And then they start to wonder, is this guy full of it? Is he not full of it? Like I'm just no, no, we're just having a conversation, man. This is me. Yep. The one thing I am not, I am not a bullshitter. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. When you look at your clients that you speak to, they come to you, they're like, hey, I need a website or my website sucks. When you get to know these people a little bit, what would you say the biggest mistake, the number one mistake you see people make with their marketing? It's either something they shouldn't do or something they're not doing at all. Probably the biggest mistake, I've, and this kind of goes back to what we were saying before, they yeah. try to overcomplicate it, yeah. right? So they're trying to do too many things at once. And I think that, this may stem from, it, this is really more for the new clients. So I think when the new clients come in, they're in, they're in masterminds, they're watching YouTube videos and they get great content. I'm like, you should do this and you should do this. You should do this. Now this is coming from folks that have done all that stuff, but they didn't do it all at once. Right. I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day. So it was slowly, slowly, slowly. They added it. So I tell them, I go, just, just focus on doing one thing real good. Right. At first. Right. Let, let's walk before we run yep. and let's build. We'll, we'll build your 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 website and your brand. And then Jason will work on sort of your back end funnel. Let's get that right first. Right. Let's put all our focus on it. Because what happens is you just become jack of all trades. Right. Master of none. And you're just you're you're focused on doing too many. Oh, I need this. I need this. I need that. Yep. And then we'll start to add in these other things slowly over time. So I think it's patience is probably the biggest thing that I, I, I feel people struggle with. And I get that there a lot of these folks are in communities. They have peers. They want to excel. Um, and I'm not saying just lazily approach it, but systematically set realistic goals and expectations. What happens is overwhelm happens. Yeah. I'm sure you see this as well. Yeah. Come in hooting and hollering. They're all excited. This is normal for people, right? And then next thing you know, as from because we're clients or, or they're our clients. They disappear. It's it's like crickets because um, we have a process we take them through. And I'm like, pound them on the door. And it's like they, they've they lost their steam because they were overwhelmed. You know, you mentioned endurance athlete. You know, we go to train for our, an Ironman. It's a 140.6 mile race. And you may only be able to run two miles and swim one length of the pool. That's overwhelming. But if you break it down in smaller chunks over time, I think that's what, that what people will help. There's not a specific thing like they don't write their blog posts, right? There's all of that stuff, but yeah. in a high level, Jason, like that's, I see that a lot. I see initial excitement and then it tempers off. I, I don't know. Do you see something similar? As oh well? yeah. Yeah. And it's like, even to make this more general entrepreneurs in general, 
right? When somebody goes to start a business or start a new venture, the six months, the first six months, oh man, are they excited. It's the honeymoon phase. They haven't had to deal with failure, disappointment, rejection, et cetera, et cetera yet. But as you know, uh, most people, you know, dip out within two years, almost all within five because it is a mental meat grinder. So uh, things in my experience, I'm not a patient guy, but things take longer than you think most of the time. And uh, I did, for me, like I just couldn't work for somebody. I was like, I feel dead when I do it. So this has to work because there's no other alternative. And I said, uh, when I first quit my job, I was making 80 grand a year in corporate. I quit corporate twice. So the first time I quit, I told my wife, we'll replace this monthly income within uh, six months. Within two months, I was out of money and I had made zero dollars, not a penny. So why did I come up with six months? I just literally made the shit up. There's no <laughs> science to it. And, you know, it took yes. time for me to kind of figure it out, something repeatable. So the point is, um, we don't get to pick the timelines, man. Uh, some people have success really fast. For most people, it takes takes a while, right? It takes a while to figure some things out. But yeah, patience is a, a great piece of advice. Yeah, and like, it was funny, you mentioned that six months, right? And, yeah. and someone could look at that and said, now, so you, it was six months, and did you go back to corporate and then sort of uh, quit again? Is that is that what happened there? Yeah. Was, so, resign, I like resign, sounds better. Yeah, so I had to, uh, so we ran out of money. I had to ask one of my aunts for help. I'm like, hey, I can't pay my mortgage or buy food, but I can help with the rest. And she's like, I hate what you're doing. I think it's a mistake. I'll help you for six months and you're done. So right at the end of that, um, I was working at FedEx. I wouldn't make enough money. It's making 95 bucks a week, um, which doesn't buy anything in today's world, yeah. not even food. So I was hustling in the neighborhood and doing different stuff. And uh, I had to go back for about 18 months. I think I went through three different sales jobs. And then I left mortgages. And uh, I told them when I hired them, this is what I'm doing. I get to this point, I'm out. And they were uh, very supportive of that. They were like, we want you to succeed. And uh, I got to a point one day, uh, it was actually about uh, five years ago, maybe this week, honestly. My wife's like, I've seen enough. It's time for you to do what you're doing now full time. So I've been full time ever since. But that whole journey took way longer than I thought, you know? Yeah, but it, it's funny. A lot of folks will look at that and be like, it, it was in that journey and that like scrapping and pain and suffering that you learned your most, right? And that's, I think, the biggest lesson in patience is that, I mean, all, we're trying to change, right? We're trying to change your business. We're trying to create something, which is change, right? That's where this whole brand was born from. Adapt was all, because I'm a big change guy, right? Um, if you don't, If you're not good at it, you're not good at change. The only constant in life, right, is change. Yeah. If you suck at it, then your life's gonna suck, right? Yeah. So um, the 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 act of change, though, for people once they dissect it and understand it, and they start to feel that resistance. That's what you mentioned, like when that when the yeah. when you know they get you get past the honeymoon, you get to the hard part, yeah. right? So I remember wanting to learn how do you do the Rubik's cube. I was all excited. I'm gonna learn this thing. I'm gonna do it in a minute. Be like one of those de geeks. So I bought it. And I watched the videos and then I got frustrated and I, and I put it away for like six months. And then finally I realized when I went through the whole change thing, I was like, I realized what happened. I hit the stress, the part where it gets hard and yeah. I quit. Right. So if we can associate with when it sucks, right. When, when, yeah. when things are hard, it's terrible. You're up late and you can start to say to yourself, no, this is where the growth happens. Right. It's when your muscles are stressed at the gym that you get the greatest stimulus. Same thing. When, when stuff is awful, that's that is growth yeah. that's where you get better so like those things you went through like all those struggles man that's like that made you who you are today that's why you're successful I, I, i'm a true believer of that so if you didn't go through that you wouldn't be where you are today yeah i appreciate that and what's funny is like i have like two moods like people who know me well know this i'm either happy or effing furious right <laughs> when i struggle in business or i, I you know, can't make the sales i want to make I get pissed off. I get really pissed off. I don't get pissed off at other people. I'm like, I'm going to go find sales today. So it turns into immediate, relentless, sociopathic energy, and it gets stuff done, right? People say, what's the secret to success? Consistent effort. That, mm -hmm. That's my answer, right? And and there's no no idea how long that'll take. So There's, uh, there's power in the dark side, brother. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. So this will be interesting to hear from you. Um, can you share a story about your journey, uh, whether it's building the capital raising business or the marketing business that you haven't shared publicly? It can be funny. It can be failure, success, whatever you want. Something that might show uh, a little 
different side of you to the audience. Some vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, I could share this story of how I realized that I need to take greater control of my investing journey through a really bad investment. That's yeah. a, this, is, this is a good story. Um, you know, I, 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 I was fortunate when I had the medical distribution company that we had some good success. Like we, we were, we're doing well financially. You're getting three meals a day and all that. Oh, what's that? <laughs> You're getting three meals a day and all that, right? Three meals a day. Yeah. I was getting full three meals and snacks. So right. I was, I was getting snacks in there and, um, and it was, uh, it was good. And I started, uh, spending money frivolously on dumb things and you know, cars and stuff like that. I was just, I was younger and stupid, you know, and then what didn't had no guidance. And, um, I, I started investing in things just because I think people saw that I was having some success and I, I, I saw me as, as prey. Uh, so I invested in a couple things that were, I, they seemed like good ideas at the time, but now that I look back at them, I'm like, oh my God, those were awful investments. Not because they failed, but because I just didn't vet them out. I had to look into them. So, uh, the one in particular I could think of, so I had a, I had a buddy of mine whose dad had a car dealership and it was a buy here, pay here car dealership in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, at a buy here, pay here, they charge, um, a very high interest rates. So, and you know, I'm talking 27%, right. To buy a car. It seems predatory. It is, uh, but that's, they have, their credit score is literally zero. So they're taking a lot of risk. So the deal was, was I would become what they call the floor plan, which typically floor plan in the car industry, for those who don't understand, that's like the financing, the way they finance to bring all the inventory in. So I would go buy the car. So they go buy the cars at auction for like, you know, four grand. You know, they're kind of older cars. They had certain mileage requirements and they checked them out, make sure they were good. And then they would tack on their part, right? So they'd tack on the, um, what their profit and then some. And then they'd add the interest rate to it. So now they're financing like a ten thousand dollar car, right, at twenty seven percent interest on an asset that I just acquired at like four grand. Basic math. Yeah. So you start to do the math and the returns on this, and it was astronomical. And the deal was: imagine each one of these is an asset goes out into the world, literally drives off the lot, but there's low jack inside the car. So if they didn't pay their their car payment, no problem. I'm gonna shut your car off. I'm gonna go take the asset, bring it back, resell it to somebody else. And then we're good. Right. Yeah. So I gave them all, I, I gave them a quarter million dollars. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to be, I'm going to be very honest with you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they went out and they bought like uh, 30, 40 cars or something like that, whatever that math is. And then they, um, they, the, what the deal was, they're just going to give me cash distributions. And, and we landed on a number. I think it was like three or four grand a month that I was just getting. And, but my portfolio was like growing and the, the fund was growing. I didn't know anything about investing. I was like, cool, I get three grand a month. But I'm like, and I did the math. I'm like, that's really not very good cash flow on that. <laughs> when I look at it today. So uh, fast forward many years later, about, I think it was about three years later. And I, I had gone through a divorce um, and uh, I was going through a, a sort of a very dark and challenging time in my life. And I, I took my eyes off it. Natural, right? So then, um, all of a sudden, I, uh, the, the check stopped showing up at the mailbox. I was like, oh, that's weird. So uh, first month, I was like, ah, oh, whatever. Maybe it's just lost in the mail. I'm sure it'll show up. And then another month, three months. So finally, I call him. They're not really answering the phone. But this is like my buddy's dad. And I knew where he lived. So I called him. I was like, I was like, hey, man, what's what's going on? He's like, I think you should come down here. We'll just have a conversation. I was like, <laughs> okay. So now I was with my now new wife and, and I kind of like filled around the story. She, she's like, you gave him how much? And I was like, I know. So, and, and so we, we, we drove, we drove down to Atlanta. We walk into the room, open the door. I walked in, sit down. I'm thinking they're just gonna, they're like, yeah, it's all gone. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? It's all gone. They're like, it's, it's all gone. We, we, we lost it all. I was like, how did you lose it? You had low jack, the whole thing. They're like, we got busy. We took our eyes off it and we weren't collecting payments. Some cars are in Mexico. Some cars are at the bottom of a lake. Some cars were set on a fire. I was like, you gotta be freaking kidding me. I was like, what? I think you have none left. They're like, we have like, it was like six or eight cars in the portfolio. So my wife is a very strong willed Southern woman and she grabs that stuff and she goes, a few guys. She's like, I'm taking over now. We're collecting the car payments. So for the next two years, we had to sit there and collect car payments 
repo cars off people. Um, I, I got cussed out by like some dude's mom because I called him and told him I was going to repo his car. I mean, it was just really some just not <laughs> enjoyable process. Uh, you know, the, all the cars have either crashed or burned or something at this point. It's that that was a long time ago. But yeah, that was so I was able to recoup some of it. I was. Yeah. Um, I had a, ca a car brought here in a flatbed truck. Um, and but but yeah, that was. But what I learned from that man is the importance of really um, knowing what you're investing in, uh, vetting what you're investing in. And to this day, I said I'm not going to invest in anything unless I have some sort of involvement in it. Yeah. Right. So truly, almost like an active investor. So, so when I looked at all the asset classes, that's why I said real estate just makes sense. No one can go drive in a lake. Uh, they can't take it to Mexico. <laughs> well, unless it's a uh, mobile home park. Sure. That was, yeah. The tornado could take it into a lake. But, uh, but yeah, it was going with some safer things. It seemed like a great plan at first, man. Uh, but, but yeah, that was a total, total crash and burn, all puns intended. So there you go. <laughs> that's a great story. Great advice out of that, man. Um, all right. So let's say that I'm a brand new active capital raiser and say, Hey, Derek, I'm going to start doing this. What's the one piece of advice you give me about my marketing? Genuine authenticity in everything that you create. So when you're creating your brand, avoid imposter syndrome. So avoid beating someone that you're not. I'm sure you run into this too as well, Jason, right? I had somebody come to me and they said, Hey, I want my brand to be just like Grant Cardone's. I'm talking same colors, same look, same videos, the whole thing. And I was like, okay. I was like, it's cool to, you know, want to aspire to, I was like, but exactly like Grant Cardone? I'm like, are you like Grant Cardone? And he's like, no, not at all. He's like, I'm actually pretty timid, kind of shy. I'm like, not really like him at all. I don't want to be on camera. I was like, so you want the success of Grant Cardone is what you're saying, but you don't really want to be like Grant Cardone. I was like, here's the thing. I was like, people are going to connect with Grant because Grant's the way Grant is, right? You know, he's going to be unshaven on his plane, dropping F-bombs. And some people connect with that. Some people are turned off by Grant Cardone. They think he's a jerk, right? Um, it all depends. I was like, so the key is being truly authentic and genuine from your branding, the way it looks, literally down to the colors when we do the design, to the shapes of things to the video that's delivered, to the copy, to the emails that your automated system is sending, all of that, the text messages, like you said, we said this earlier, genuine authenticity, right? And just be you because when you're not you and they finally meet you, it's not going to line up and immediately distrust is going to come into play. I can't place enough emphasis on the importance of that. So that that's, that's where I think um, people really need to focus on when it comes to their marketing. Yeah, I think it's really good advice. And uh, one of my least favorite phrases is fake it to make it. I just disagree strongly. Do what you want to do. But I would tell people, hey, I don't know what I'm doing with MailChimp, but if you hire me, I'll figure it out. I would let people know, always honest. Hey, I haven't raised capital yet, but we're about to start this week. So you want to invest with us? Here's what we got. Like we got a deck and we got people we're working with, but I'm not going to pretend I've raised money when I have it. Right. Yep. And people are like, oh, that's scary. Why? Everybody starts in the same place. Why is it scary? Right, own it, embrace it, and you will find that that uh, that like and trust factor can happen very, very quickly, especially through video. So, yeah, it's great advice. Um, all right, we are recording this in late March, twenty twenty three. What are you most focused on for your portfolio of businesses between now and the end of the year? My portfolio of businesses, like the business that I own. Um, so. Creating synergy between them. So, you know, so I've got this, this Adapt brand. So we've got Adapt Media Agency, the marketing firm. Um, but I've got Adapt My Wealth, which is the capital raising firm. Yep. And then Adapt My Health, which is focused on health, wellness. Uh, we uh, developed some supplementation. Is just, and I feel there's some synergy in that it's all under the Adapt brand. But just creating other uh, systems, automations, and synergies inside of them. So that they all sort of coalesce well together um, and really finding, taking that that uh, who not how approach. So yep. continuing to bring in high quality talent that can help drive that and just deliver good value and be consistent to our customer base because I have the tendency, you know, we, we talked about our vulnerable things about our personalities. I have the tendency to want to be the person who does everything. I think I can do it all. 
in my mind and then I realize that I can't and I take on too many things and I take on too many tasks, tasks that I'm better suited having someone else do because they're just better at it. Yep. And so and I just create more stress for myself and you learn all this other stuff, but I, I but it's really finding those people, finding those systems so that it's a business, not a job. Yep. Um, and um, yeah, so that's important. But all the while, man, making sure that I'm actively, actively involved in it because uh, that's important to me. These are passions of mine. Every business I have, it's because I actually like doing this. I don't feel like I work when I wake up. I Maybe mean, sometimes I do, depending on the client. But generally speaking, like I, I, I love this. We won't name any names. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's awesome, man. Uh, and I will, I will say this to the audience before I ask this last question. Derek is the only guy that I recommend to anybody in marketing. Right? I don't take that lightly because when I used to work in the corporate world two different times, I knew people that I worked with or I knew them and I gave them my stamp of approval and they went to work with a company I either worked for or used to and they just fell on their face. And I was like, I don't want my name associated with trash. You know what I mean? It's about effort, right? And so I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. So for years, people say, oh, who do you recommend for this? Who do you re I don't recommend anybody, right? Yeah. For one, I don't make friends with my competitors because it's a waste of my time. And two, most people who say they do stuff aren't very good. But Derek is the one exception for that. So uh, if you guys need a website, you guys need a landing page, you guys want to set up a podcast, et cetera, you need to speak to Derek. You get that rec recommendation from me now and off the air, but I don't recommend anybody else for a reason. They got to earn that shit, you know? So yeah. with that being said, if somebody watching or listening wants to get more info from you or learn how they can connect, what's the best way they can do so? Yeah, so I appreciate that. So they can uh, they can head to our website. Um, I'll, I'll list a couple of here. So it's uh, adaptmediaagency.com. Uh, and then on the capital raising side, it's Adapt My Wealth. Dot com, or you can just pop me an email, Derek, so it's D-E-R-E-K, at adaptmediaagency.com. Um, that would be great. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, anyway, way of those. And there's a few other sites, but I won't list them off. But those are probably the best ones that are you know most uh, consistent with this. When you own a marketing firm, you open a lot of businesses. So it's, uh, you know, but I, but these are, these are my babies. Um, and, and I do appreciate that recommendation as well, Jason. And the future, the feeling is mutual. So... Uh, you know, I, I only recommend one other person uh, in, in, in terms of marketing, and, and that's you. So we, the, I do appreciate that working relationship that we've developed. Yep, me too, man. So awesome. Awesome show today. Something very different for the audience, but I have a feeling they're going to like it. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me on. Yep, see you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show. I had a great time making it, and I hope you really enjoyed yourself listening to it. If you want to keep up with all things Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories podcast related, I encourage you strongly to go to reimarketingstories.com and signing up for our podcast newsletter. We will simply keep you up to date with what's going on at the show, new episodes, and things like that. reimarketingstories.com. So hopefully today's episode and the other episodes that you'll listen to will remind you that as a real estate investor, everybody starts at the beginning, okay? Um, our guest today and the other guests that you will hear on this show will share their real story, right? They'll tell you what worked, what didn't work. And I want you to remember one thing if you remember nothing else today. It's possible for you to, okay? Never stop going and keep following your passion. Finally, today's show has been brought to you by CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. If you're an active capital raiser and you're ready to learn the three areas that are holding you back from raising more capital, I strongly suggest you check out CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. Check out our free 10-minute video there, and you let me know if it doesn't provide you value. I'm sure it will. All right, thanks again for listening to the show this week. Hope to see you next time. Take care.